Hello one and all, welcome to another online video by Einstein Academy. In this video, we'll be stepping aside from behavior content of the GCH2 chemistry. Instead, I've chosen to talk about a topic called logic. Logic is important in every aspect of life. It is used and applied widely in, say, physics, chemistry, biology, mathematics, and in fact, every aspect of life. Even when you have to cross the road, you want to make an investment, it all involves logic. If you are able to have good logic, you'll be able to make good arguments, which will allow you to make sound decisions. So this is an area that I would like to talk about. And the main thing that I want you guys to take away from this lecture is basically to exercise your brain juice and follow the arguments and the material that I present here and to think about many different forms of arguments and to see which ones are valid and which ones are not valid so that you can think better. Okay, so follow me as we embark on a journey of thinking. So why study logic? We study logic so that we can reason better and be able to construct good arguments. If you're able to construct good arguments, given the data from the question, you can construct good arguments and combine it with the concepts that we learn in each chapter. It will allow us to better solve each question. And this to become stronger at formulating a correct train of thought is also helping us to be able to solve the question and therefore be able to become better at solving the questions. So we are repeated so many times, it's becoming solving, better at solving questions, but it is true. The purpose of logic is for many purposes, but in the area for academic and for examination purposes, it's for this purpose. If we have bad logic, it will lead us to the wrong conclusions and basically we will get the answers wrong for every question. So look at this um, figure. This penguin says that penguins are black and white. Some old TV shows are black and white. Therefore, some penguins are old TV shows. So clearly, this penguin is a bit educated because he can tell that he's black and white. And some old TV shows are black and white. However, he has bad logic and then makes the conclusion that some penguins are old TV shows. And of course, we know that it's not true that some penguins are old TV shows. And this is an example of how bad logic can lead us to the wrong conclusions. Validity of an argument. So as I said, logic is applied to, um, to arguments mainly, and we'd like to define when is an argument valid. An argument is valid if and only if, whenever, if the premises are true, so is the conclusion. So let me explain by what is premises and conclusion. Okay, so for example, if an, as an example of a form of a valid argument, the premise is if P then Q, then the second premise is P and therefore you conclude that Q must be true. So basically, right, P and Q can be replaced by various statements and it is true that if we agree that the premise one, that if P then Q is true, and we also agree on premise two that P is true, then we do not have to argue whether the conclusion is true or not because if the argument is in this form, it is guaranteed that if we agree that the premises one and two are true, it must necessarily follow that the conclusion is true. So this is a form of a valid argument. So what's an example of this form of a valid argument if we replace P and Q with some statements? So premise one, if it's raining, then it's cloudy. Premise two, it's raining. Conclusion is therefore it's cloudy. So you can see that this is statement P. This is statement P, this is statement Q, this is statement P, and this is statement Q. So it is indeed in the form of a valid argument, and we don't have to argue whether the conclusion is true or not. What we have to discuss is whether premise one and premise two is true or not. So let's look at, let's look at this argument to decide whether it's sound or not. We'll talk about the definition for sound, but for, for the moment, let's just talk about whether premise one and two is true or not. If it's raining, then it's cloudy. So this is, I hope that we agree that all, um, all of us agree that this is true. If there's, if there's no clouds, it can't rain. This premise too is subjective. Of course, you look from day to day. If you look outside your window, if it's raining, then of course P is true. And of course, on the day whereby it's raining, we have to agree with the conclusion that it's also a cloudy day. An example, another example of a form of a valid argument, if it's the sodium atom, then it has 11 electrons. Premise two it has, is the sodium atom and conclusion is therefore it has 11 electrons. Again, if we look at the form of the argument, this is statement P, 
this is statement Q, and this is statement P, and this is statement Q. So it is indeed in the form of if P then Q, P therefore Q. And therefore, this is also a valid argument. And all we have to discuss is whether is premise one true or not, and if premise two is true or not. If premise one, we agree to be true, and premise two, we agree to be true, we have to agree that the conclusion is true. There's no other way about it because it's in the form of invalid argument. And let me remind you, what is the meaning of invalid argument? If we agree that the premises are true, the conclusion must necessarily follow to be true. There's no second way of um, arguing whether it's the conclusion right or not, if we agree that premises are true. Okay, so the sodium atom indeed has 11 electrons, so we can agree that premise one is true. And if we look at a particular sample and we somehow manage to deduce that it's the sodium atom, then we will know that that sample of sodium atom indeed has 11 electrons. Let's look at an example of a form of an invalid argument. Premise one, if P then Q, and premise two is Q and therefore P. This is the form of an invalid argument because if the argument takes this form, even if the premises are true, it is not necessarily true that the conclusion, the conclusion doesn't necessarily have to follow to be true. Sorry about that. The conclusion doesn't necessarily have to follow to be true. So let's look at the example. If it's raining, then it's cloudy. It's cloudy, therefore it's raining. So this is statement P, this is statement Q, this is statement Q, and this is statement P. Okay, this is in the form of an invalid argument. Even if the premises are true, it is not true that the, the conclusion, we have to accept it to be true. Premise one, we can agree that it's the same thing. If it's raining, it has to be a cloudy day. If we look outside the window and we deduce that it's a cloudy day, however, can we conclude that it's raining? It's not true because any cloudy day doesn't mean that it has to be raining. And that's the reason why if it's in this form of an argument, it is an form of an invalid argument whereby even if we accept the premises to be true, we cannot say that the conclusion is necessarily true. This example, this is statement P, this is statement Q, this is statement Q, and this is statement P. Again, it's in the form of an invalid argument. If it's a sodium atom, then it has 11, 11 electrons. We can agree that this premise is true. If we look at a particular sample and we deduce that that thing has 11 electrons, can we conclude that it's definitely the sodium atom? The answer is no, because the Mg plus ion also has 11 electrons and the Al2 plus ion also has 11 electrons. So there are many, many different species that can have 11 electrons that is not necessarily the sodium atom. So as you can see, if it's in the form of an invalid argument, even if we agree on premises one and two, we cannot say that the conclusion is necessarily true. Let's look at this example. This is statement P, this is statement Q, this is statement Q, and this is statement P. Take a look at this um, argument. If it's the sodium atom, then it has 10 protons. We can agree that this is true. If the sample has 10 protons, then can we conclude that it's the sodium atom? We mentioned before that this form of an argument, if P then Q, Q therefore P, this is in the form of an invalid argument. But what we said is that for an invalid argument, even if we accept that premises one and two is true, it doesn't necessarily follow the conclusion that it has to be necessarily true. However, there's nothing to say that the conclusion cannot be true. Because if we look at this example, it is true that if something has 10 protons, it must necessarily follow that it's the sodium atom. It's just that this form of an argument is invalid because there are some cases whereby if premises one and two is true, we do not follow that the conclusion is true, just like in this example, as well as in the previous example. Okay, I hope you understand what's the meaning of a valid argument and an invalid argument. Again, if it's a valid argument, if we accept that the premises are true, we don't have to discuss whether the conclusion is true or not. The conclusion must necessarily be true. An invalid argument, we can argue to the cows come home whether the premise one and two is true or not, but there's no point discussing it because like, what we really want is the conclusion, but even, even if we can settle on whether the premises are true or not, 
you still cannot arrive at the conclusion because the argument is in the form of an invalid argument. The soundness of an argument, an argument is sound if and only if, if it's valid and also all its premises are true. So this is a stricter condition than the validity of an argument because for invalidity of an argument, we just have to make sure that as long as the premises are true, the conclusion follows to be true. However, for soundness, we must also make sure that all the premises are true. An unsound argument is one whether it's either in the form of an invalid argument or it actually has one or more false premises. Soundness is generally difficult to access because basically we are actually trying to decide whether the premises are true or not. And a lot of times, the statements of premises is not easy to decide whether it's true or not. Most of the time, as good scientists, we have to carry out experiments to decide whether premises are true or not. So for example, global warming causes rising sea levels. I guess a lot of us can say that this is definitely true, but the thing is that as good scientists, we need scientific evidence to prove that premise one is true. And it takes a lot, a lot of research before we can decisively, decisively say that premise one is true and anything causing rising sea levels should be prevented. This statement, although it sounds very obvious, but it's not necessarily true. How do we know that rising sea levels may not be something good, right? So it's not easy to discuss whether premises are true or not because we need a lot of scientific study and evidence to prove whether they are true or not. However, for example, this form of an argument is in a valid form of an argument because global warming causes rising sea levels. Anything causing rising sea levels should be prevented. So if global warming causes rising sea levels, it must be prevented. So this is in the form of a valid argument. If we agree on premise one and premise two, we have to agree on the conclusion. However, we need not have to agree on whether premises are true or not. We, as I said, we have to do scientific studies to prove whether premises are true or not. So it's not that easy to access. More work has to be done. We cannot just simply look at the form of an argument to decide whether it's valid or not. Okay, the next part, which I think is a very important part in logic, is fallacies in argument. Basically, when two people argue, they can be arguing with invalid arguments or using faulty reasoning in the construction of an argument. You can argue to the cows come home and then like nothing will come out of it because like both of them are not constructing good arguments. So um, I guess that's also a lot of the sources of quarrel. In fact, when you look at two people discussing something, sometimes when you look at their logic, it's like off lot. So, and they get very angry about it because each other cannot see each other's point. But in fact, sometimes they are just actually using wrong logic in the first place. So it doesn't even matter whether they see each other's point or not. Because even if, we, even if they're able to see each other's point, the conclusion may be wrong. Okay, some fallacious argument may be deceptive in appearing that is better than it really is. So we need to be able to dissect to see whether arguments are good arguments or are they bad arguments. So I'm going to talk about a few fallacies in arguments. Fallacy of denying the antecedent. So basically denying the antecedent means that you want to deny the previous stuff that happened. So let's look at, let's look at this argument. Premise one, if you have not studied hard for your exam, you will fail. So what we want to deny is the fact that we will fail. So we make this statement that saying that you have studied hard for your exam and therefore you wouldn't fail. However, this is not a valid argument because premise one only says that if you have not studied hard for your exam, you will fail. It did not say anything on the fact whether you have, if you have studied hard for your exam, will you fail or not? In fact, I guess as students, we have experienced this a lot of times, even if you studied hard, you still fail. So clearly, this is in the form of an invalid argument and the fallacy is because we are already trying to establish the fact that we do not want to fail and we construct an argument to deny the previous cause of the argument. So this is called the fallacy of denying the antecedent. The second one is the fallacy of confirming the consequent. Basically, what it means is that we want to confirm that we have not studied hard for the exam. So for example, look at this argument. Premise one, if you have not studied hard for your exam, you will fail. What we want to do, what we wish to do, is to confirm the fact that we have not studied hard for the exam or somebody has not studied hard for the exam. And therefore, we say premise two that you will fail. And then you will fail and therefore, you have not studied hard for your exam. This is again not true. 
again, we know that you can study hard for your exam and you still fail. So this is called the fallacy of conforming the consequence. Basically, you want, you want the consequence to be true. You want this consequence to be true. And as a result, you try to construct an invalid argument to confirm the consequence of the argument. False dilemma. There, there actually exists more options or possibilities than those presented in one's argument. So for example, if we look at this false dilemma argument, either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. Premise 2 states that you, are not with the, you should not be with the terrorists and therefore the conclusion is, therefore you should be with us. It seems like this is a valid argument, right? Anyway, you know, you should be with us sounds like, all right, because you should not be with the terrorists. I guess like we can agree that we should not be with the terrorists. This is an accurate premise. So what is the, where is the false dilemma? Because, right, it is not true that we have to be either with you or with the terrorists, right? We can be neutral, right? We can be a neutral party whereby we are not favoring either side. And therefore, this premise one is wrong because it's kind of like stating that there's only two possibilities, but there actually exist more possibilities. And one of the obvious possibilities is that you are a neutral party that is sitting on the fence. And therefore, this is called a false dilemma. The next fallacy is reasoning by analogy. When we are reasoning by analogy, we hold that something has a particular property because it's similar to something else that has that same property. So we are arguing by analogy. However, sometimes we cannot push analogies too far because like, while we say that maybe object A has some very similar properties to object B, it's not necessarily true that all the properties are the same and sometimes reasoning by analogy will break down when the analogy is weak or irrelevant or outweighed by other these analogies in the sense that there are other properties that actually make the analogy not a good one. Okay, so when choosing analogies, we need to be able to pay attention to finding good analogies. An example of a false analogy. So I guess this is a bit controversial, but the analogy is that we ban, we ban murder, which is a true premise. And then we say that allowing euthanasia is like allowing murder. Therefore, we should ban euthanasia to form an argument that we should ban euthanasia. However, there's a big difference between murder and euthanasia. Murder is usually defined by person A killing person B without the, um, without the, against the will of person B. However, euthanasia is most of the time when like person A is um, in, is under very, is very ill and basically he wants to basically commit suicide. So it's very different things because like one is against the person's will, but one is basically having the, um, the, the person actually is trying to commit suicide. So it's not against his will and there is no two person involved. Of course, you can talk about the doctor that's basically um, preceding over the euthanasia, but like we will just skip that because like some processes, basically the patients can just pull the plug on themselves, not pull the plug, I guess, like inject the, the, the lethal dosage of the poison into themselves and causing their own death. So you can say that it's basically um, on the accord of one person and it's not against the will. So they're not the same thing. So this is not a very strong analogy. And I would like to say that this is not a good argument that we should ban euthanasia. False cause. Just because A occurred before B, we concluded that A caused B. This is obviously not a good argument, right? Like, for example, the sun rose up and then like after that you went to buy breakfast. It's definitely not true that the sun rose up caused you to go and buy breakfast, right? It's not a cause and effect thing. Okay, more generally, if A is correlated with B, we conclude that one is the cause of the other. So the, mean, the meaning of the word correlated just means that they are related in some sense. However, two things that are related doesn't necessarily mean that one of them has to be the cause of the other. So an example of a fallacy in argument that is but true false cause. Premise one, every time we see a flash of lightning, we hear thunder shortly after. So it's like implying that because the flash of lightning occurred before the thunder and therefore the lightning causes thunder. We know that this is definitely not true. The reason that we see lightning before thunder is because our eyes is in front of our ears. Okay, that's a joke anyway. False appeal to authority. So this, in false appeal to authority, right, sometimes when you go to the courts and basically like, let's say you want, you basically need somebody to, to be a witness 
and say that basically if they collected blood from the crime scene and to be able to testify whether is it true that the blood belonged to the suspect or not. And in these cases, it's, uh, it's not a false appeal to authority if the authority really has the power and it's in expert opinion that everybody will agree that what he says will be valid or not. However, some, sometimes, right, we'll make, we'll make a false appeal to authority when the person actually does not have the authority in question. Okay, or when even the authorities will disagree about whether the proposition is true or not. In fact, if you look at many, like many, many court cases, right? Um, let's say somebody committed murder, and then the, the defense want to argue based on whether the person can get a lower sentence based on the fact that whether he is crazy or not. So what you do is that you will get a psychologist to go and um, not investigate, evaluate the person to see whether he really is suffering from lunatism. And it, because psychology studies is a bit of a subjective stuff, so like two different psychologists or two psychiatrists can actually come to different conclusions on whether he is in fact crazy or not. So these are instances where the authority is the correct authority, but even then, um, not everybody will agree on the diagnosis for, as for this example. So let's look at an example of a legitimate appeal to authority. So as I've mentioned, right? So let's say Jones. Jones is an expert in um, DNA studies. He's a person that works in the crime lab. So he testifies, he testifies. And after he analyzes the DNA sample and basically gives the testimony that the blood stain comes from the suspect. In this case, this is a legitimate appeal to authority, assuming that Jones is really a person that um, studies I guess like crime scene investigation and he basically is able to analyze DNA samples properly and his testimonies will have weight because it's the proper authority. So this is a legitimate appeal to authority. authority. An example of a false appeal to authority. So let's look at this example. Meng Zi, which is a Chinese philosopher, once said that human nature is innately good. And then another Chinese philosopher, Xin Zi, said that human nature is innately evil. So Obviously, these two cannot be true at the same time, right? So one of them has to be wrong. But it's not even, it's not even the, the importance is not even that one of them has to be wrong. The importance is that two of them are not really, I guess you can say that they, they don't really have the good authority to, to basically say these two statements on whether human nature is it innately good or innately evil. So this is a false appeal to authority. Argument from ignorance. So there are two possibilities. One is that we conclude that A is true merely on the basis that one does not have any evidence against A. Or the opposite, we conclude that A is not true, is false, merely on the basis that we do not have any evidence to support that A is true. Okay, so this statement, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Let's look at an example from argument from ignorance. It's just false that acupuncture can aid in weight loss. There's no evidence that it does. So it's like there's no evidence to support that acupuncture can aid in weight loss. So we conclude that it's false. This is not a good argument because like, although there's no evidence to suggest that it can aid in weight loss, it, um, we, we can't conclude whether it's false or not. We, we can't say anything about the fact whether acupuncture is, aids in weight loss or not, given that there is no evidence to support that it does. Another example, Santa Claus is real. You can't prove that he isn't. This argument, basically, you really can argue that the cows come home. The guy will just keep on repeating this sentence, right? Say that you can't prove that he isn't, it doesn't exist. So he must be real, he must be real, he must be real. And basically, the argument will just be like that. And you will really be annoyed at someone that argues with you like that. Um, for me, I'll just stop talking to the guy, really. At least on the subject of Santa Claus is real or not. Argument from popularity. Basically, it's argued that A is true merely on the basis that many people believe it, or we can also argue that it is false because of the basis that few people believe it. So argument by popularity is, is a very bad argument. So let's look at an example that um, from argument from popularity. Nobody believes that the earth revolves around the sun. You must be crazy to do so. Now, the thing is that we kind of, now we really truly know that the earth actually does indeed revolve around the sun. But this is a bad argument because it's like nobody believes that the earth revolves around the sun. So like why, why can't you believe that the earth actually revolves around the sun? Right? So the, the thing is that, and, and in fact, 
during before Copernicus mentioned that the sun was at the center of the universe, in fact, people actually did believe that the earth is the center of the universe and actually the sun revolves around the earth. So the, the thing is that many people believing in something doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. When Einstein discovered the, the special theory of relativity, nobody believed him because majority of the people were very, very, um, actually disliked the idea of Einstein's theory of relativity because it basically overturns what they have been learning from, the, the physics that have been learning from young. So majority of people think that Einstein's special theory of relativity is nonsense, but as time goes by, and as we do experiments to prove whether it's his theory is right or not, we come to understand that his theory of relativity is actually the right one, and eventually more and more people will start to um, understand his theory. So the point is that as good scientists, you should always base on your scientific evidence and your scientific investigation results to prove whether a theory is right or not. You cannot base on the fact that it's popular, uh, like popular belief because why not? Everybody can be wrong and you are the person that is right, right? Definitely, if you do something like that, you will definitely be honored with a very good prize because basically you, you revolve, uh, you, you kind of like, the evolution, um, revolutionary thoughts about whatever science that you're doing. Okay, so, so don't believe that um, things that many, many people believe must be the right thing. Have your own thoughts and have your own way of thinking. And if you think that it's right, try to do scientific studies and evidence and investigation to, to basically prove that you're right. The fallacy of division. One concludes that A holds true for each member of a class just because A holds true for the class itself. So the common saying is that what is true of the whole need not be true of its parts. So let's look at an example of the fallacy of division. The company is very rich. Since, since you are a member of the company, you must be rich too. I guess everybody would wish that this be true, right? So like if you work for Google, which is very rich, then does it mean that as an employee, you are definitely rich? Is not true, right? So this is a fallacy of division. What is true of the whole may not be true of its parts. The fallacy of composition, one concludes that A holds true for a class just because A holds true for each member of the class. What is true of the parts need not be true of the whole. This is kind of like the opposite of the fallacy of division. So as an example, every rock in the bag weighs less than 0 0.5 kg. And therefore, the whole bag of rocks must weigh less than 0 0.5 kg. As in each part weighs less than 0 0.5 kg, so the whole must also weigh less than 0 0.5 kg. Obviously, we know that this cannot be true. Hasty generalization. A sweeping conclusion is made based on a sample that is far too small and perhaps unrepresentative. So as an example, in a university, you cannot speak French. Mark can't speak French, so I only have a sample size of two. And then I therefore conclude that nobody at NUS can speak French. So this is too hasty of a generalization. Okay, but um, you can use statistical study to make conclusions, but as long as statistics doesn't investigate the entire population, each and every single one, you're still unable to make this conclusion. So imagine if let's say there is like, say, like um, 50,000 students at NUS, right? You basically um, ask 49,999 of them whether can they speak French or not, then all of them say they can't. Are you able to conclude that nobody at NUS can speak French? The answer is no, right? Because like you haven't asked the last guy. What if the last guy can speak French? Then your conclusion will still be wrong. But the fact that if you have already asked 49,999, I guess we cannot say it's a hasty generation, generalization, but I guess that you shouldn't make such a strong conclusion. You should probably say that um, there's an extremely high chance that nobody at NUS speaks French. Bar one. Okay, argument at hominem. I hope that's the way it's pronounced. One attacks a person instead of addressing her argument where such a personal attack is irrelevant to the quality of the argument. And this is also a very common fallacy and basically, basically like whenever two person cannot agree on an argument, they just like go shouting insults at each other, right? This has got nothing to do with whether the argument is good or not and whether like the conclusion that they're trying to make is, is good or not. So as an example, and is so ugly, you shouldn't believe what she says. Anyway, right, I just like to mention here that I just went to the random name generator to generate a name and the first one I got was N. So 
if any one of your audience out there is named as N, please don't be angry. It's, it's just an example, okay? You can replace that with any name you want. Just because someone is ugly, you, there's no point in attacking whether a person is ugly or not. It has totally no consequence to whether what she says, he or she says, is right or wrong. So don't go around insulting people when you're arguing stuff. It just doesn't make any sense. Red herring. One argues for a claim that is irrelevant to the issue under discussion. Okay, so basically like you argue that smoking is bad for my health, but you used to smoke too. If you can smoke, why can't I do the same? The fact that the other guy smokes and got nothing to do with whether smoking is bad for your health or not, right? Like someone wants to commit suicide doesn't mean, has no relevance to whether you should commit suicide or not. So like this is basically like argue for something else that's totally irrelevant to the issue that we're discussing. Like, and in this case, we're trying to discuss whether smoking is bad for my health or not. Like, even if you talk about popular, popular beliefs, like a lot of people smoke, but it's got totally nothing to do with whether the fact that smoking is bad for my health or not. It's two separate issues. So the, the point is in logic a lot of times, right? We have gone through so many fallacies. The important thing is really to think about it and keep on like dissecting an argument and ask yourself like, this argument, like, does it make any sense or not? Like, is there anything about, weird about an argument? And, you, and, and there's no like very good guideline to, because there's infinite number of arguments that you can put out and there's no really good guideline to decide whether each argument, are there any fallacies in, fallacies in it or not. So the point is that you really have to exercise your brain and keep on thinking and exercising your brain juice to, to come and understand and dissect more and more arguments to be able to, to learn for yourself whether arguments are good arguments and whether they are valid or not. Equivocation. When putting forward an argument, one equivocates when one misleadingly switches the meaning of some term used in the argument. Okay, so as a very like, extreme example, he stood very low to get to where he is today. Okay, so, so basically this is like a moral statement, right? He didn't do, he has bad ethics in order to get, in order to rise to his position. And therefore the conclusion is his back is aching all the time saying that because like he, he goes very low, literally. So this is equivocation because like, it's like switching the meaning of this terms used, like stooping very low. This does not literally mean that he bends down very low. Okay, so this is a fallacy in argument. Amphiboly, a synthetic ambiguity is exploited in one's argument. So if you look at this example, a cup of tea is better than nothing. Nothing is better than a cold beer. Therefore, a cup of tea is better than a cold beer. It's like saying, right, tea is better than nothing and nothing is better than a cold beer. So it must be true that like the tea is better than the cold beer. So what's wrong with this argument? Like it's not obvious, I guess, but the thing is that th think about it for a while. This second statement, it says that nothing is better than a cold beer. It's actually saying that cold beer is the best, right? So in fact, if you really like agree with this statement that nothing is better than a cold beer, the conclusion is actually that the cold beer is better than the tea. Okay, so this is like playing with words in the sense that you're exploiting the, the ambiguity in the words in one's argument to derive at a false conclusion. Okay, okay. so let's look at an interesting example. Everybody loves somebody. If there's somebody such that he or she is loved by everybody, he or she is blessed. Therefore, there is somebody who is blessed. Okay, the interesting thing about this argument is that there are two ways to read the argument. One way, one way of reading the argument will make it that the argument is valid and the other way to read it is that it's not. So what are these two ways? So I'm going to leave this example for you guys to think about it and you can leave your answers in the comments and we can discuss this further on what are the two ways that will make this arguments valid and what is the other way that will make it not valid. Okay, this is an interesting example. It's, it's really like playing with words and if the words you read it in different ways, you will arrive at a different conclusion on whether the argument is valid or not. Begging the question, when one begs the question, one presupposes what one is trying to establish. It's kind of like you already inbuilt the conclusion into your argument. So like, of course you will get at the conclusion that you want to establish. Okay, so like for example, you want to argue that Jones is an unmarried man. So you just say something silly, uh, not something silly, but in the sense that something obvious, Jones is a bachelor. Oh, therefore I conclude that he's an unmarried man. So in some sense, this is like fei hua, right? Because like, it's very obvious that if this is true, this must be true. You must well not have said anything. It's like saying that, 
I'm trying to um I'm, I'm trying to draw a square that every side is 90 degrees. I'm trying to draw a square that every side is equal. Okay, it's like saying nothing at all. The appeal to pity is also a very common fallacy. The argument in which someone tries to win the support for an argument or idea by exploiting his or her opponent's feelings of pity or guilt. So one of the examples for appeal to pity is this. In a courtroom, ladies and gentlemen of the jury look at this miserable man in a wheelchair, unable to use his legs. So it's like a very pitiful guy, right? Like, is it possible that such a man can really be guilty of embezzlement? Well, honestly, a person that is going to carry out embezzlement doesn't really have to rely on his legs. So the fact that he is in the wheelchair has got, has got nothing to do with whether he can commit embezzlement or not. However, I, I guess like I would just like to mention that it, in a court, it, in a court, right, it, it's like basically you just basically just you just want the jury to believe you so that they can um they can give you the verdict that is in your favor. So although the appeal to PT is not a very good, it's not a good argument at all. However, I guess that it applies a lot to court, um, especially in front of the jury, to be able to pity you and somehow sway the verdict in your favor. Okay, it's not a good argument, but it's commonly used. Attacking a straw man, so it's a form of argument and an informal fallacy based on giving the impression of refuting an opponent's argument while actually refuting an argument that was not presented by that argument. So it's like you twisted his argument and basically like you twisted his conclusion and basically you're arg arguing like a very, very subtly different thing as what he was trying to say. It's not even the same thing. Okay, this is very commonly used in, I guess, politics. And we're going to look at this like longer example and it's related to science, right? So. When Charles Darwin discovered the theory of evolution, I guess like many people didn't like it because, well, I guess like mainly it's because those that have um, religious beliefs basically do not like his idea of evolution. Although in, I guess like in, in reality, right, evolution may not be in contradiction with whether God exists or not. Okay, but it's just that when the hysteria come out, for some reason he just gets attacked because like evolution, people think that evolution is contradictory to whether God exists or not. Okay, let's look at this article. Whereas the writings of Charles Darwin, the father of evolution, promoted the justification of racism, and his books on the origin of species and the descent of men postulate a hierarchy of superior and inferior races. So what, what is this like superior and inferior races talking about, right? Basically, if you understood a bit more about the theory of evolution is that there's natural selection and some species will be better at surviving at an environment as compared to other species and those species that are superior in that sense that they can survive better in the environment i guess you can call them superior races and like yeah but it's just a theory right the, the theory is that some races are better adapted to survive an environment and some race some some species are not for, for example um, if you look at moths, right? Moths can evolve into two types, black moths and white moths. So if, if the area is very highly polluted, the black moths will be able to camouflage themselves better in the environment because there's more soot and it'll be more dirty, right? And as a result, they will be less likely to be hunted by, by, um, by predators and they will have a high chance to survive. We're not basically saying that whether are we biased toward black moths or white moths? It's just a construct of nature that there are two different moths and one of them just has a better, better way of survival in that particular environment. On the other hand, if let's say we are in an environment whereby there's a lot of snow, then the white moth is going to survive better, right? There's, there's nothing to say whether we are being biased or not. There's no such thing. It's just nature just basically selects the species that is best adapted to that environment and they'll be able to give off more offspring and the majority of that species will have the particular trait. Okay, so like if you look at the second part, be it resolved that because, because of the fact that the evolution, there is a hierarchy of superior and inferior, inferior races, which is not even the, what the theory of evolution is trying to, not driving at, that the legislative of Louisiana does hereby deplore all instances and all ideologies of racism. 
and thus hereby reject the core concepts of the Darwinist ideology that certain races and classes of humans are inherently superior to others, and thus hereby condemn the extent to which these philosophies have been used to justify and approve racist practices. I have no idea how the theory of evolution becomes so twisted such that it's becoming said that the theory of evolution is to justify and approve racist practices. It's like totally nonsense. So it's very commonly used in like um, politics and, and stuff to basically like put down certain new theories that people don't like. Okay, that's attacking a straw man. Okay, so we have come to the last slide of the lecture. So we have talked about like some forms of the validity of an argument, like what's the meaning of the soundness of an argument. And the main, and we talk about a lot of fallacies in arguments. So notice that it's not meant to be a comprehensive lecture in the sense that after you you listen to this lecture, right, and you basically you will immediately be able to dissect any given argument and know that whether it's valid or not, is it a good argument or not? Do we accept the conclusions or not? It's not meant to be that way. It's an exercise for you to think and basically understand that there are good arguments, there are bad arguments, and be able to see through the, the very um, things that can be very misleading to arrive at the right conclusions. Okay, so I, I hope that you have like a rough idea of what logic is. In, in fact, like if you look at the, at, at, at the NUS, right, the, there's a module called logic and it's actually a 13 week module in the sense that every week there's a one, uh, there's a two hour lecture. So obviously this is nowhere near two hours, but I just want to give you a rough idea of how logic should be used and how you should apply it. Basically, the main point again that I want to drive home is use your brain to think about whether what the, the things that people say is it true or not. Okay? The, don't like many people say that it's true, therefore it's true. Okay, bad argument. Okay, so how can we apply logic to solving questions? So, like if you look at this flow chart, basically, like when you're given the question, there will be a certain amount of information given in the question. So you analyze the information. And then based on the concepts that you have learned in the chapter in, or in my lectures or in wherever notes that you have find, apply the, uh, the concepts and then use the concepts to construct good arguments grounded in good logic. And then you'll be able to solve the question with, um, with good accuracy at a high frequency. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed this lecture. Do drop your comments in the comment section to let me know whether you like this video and you like to see more of such videos that is not necessarily has to be like JC content and stuff, um, general knowledge. And if you like the video, just hit the like and subscribe button and stay tuned. And I'll see you for another episode from Einstein Academy. See you.